Hi. Thank you very much for coming um, to our talk about uh, deployment strategies on uh, Kubernetes. Uh, before speaking too much about ourselves, um, please, who of you uh, is a Java application developer? Very nice. I'm one of you. I'm also a Java developer. Uh, for the sake uh, of this uh, presentation, um, I'm a founder of a startup that makes use of Java. And uh, I need to bring uh, my application into the cloud. And I have no idea how to do it. And that's why I brought Marek, uh, who is the cloud guy, the Kubernetes and OpenShift guy. Uh, who will show us all the fancy tricks how to do such things. Hey, my, I cannot speak. Oh, can I? Can you hear me? Yes? No? <clears throat> so the agenda is very simple. We start with the uh, small, uh, small cute uh, Spring Boot application. We bring it to the cloud somehow. Um, and uh, in the end, we will speak about deployment strategies. Uh, we are very sorry not to be uh, able to uh, address A-B testing. Uh, we've done this presentation twice already, and we know there's no time for uh, all, of, all, all three of them. So uh, the uh, A-B testing goes, uh, it was strike through and will not be presented. We are sorry. <clears throat> so what's the application? What does it look like? Uh, it's a stock Spring Boot application. The startup idea is to provide a service like an Uber, but not using cars, but horses. It has many, many advantages. Horses, first, are autonomous, organic, uh, human-friendly. You can send a horse to a customer. He'll make a ride, and the horse comes back uh, to his, uh, to his uh, stage, it eats, and uh, everything uh, works by itself. Second, you surely heard that uh, diesel engines are going to be prohibited probably in uh, many German cities. I don't know if, th if this is the case in Luxembourg too, but horses won't be hit by the prohibition at all. So that's a great idea to start a business. And the, the application, uh, except for uh, having some uh, JPA entities like horses and persons, uh, has uh, one, uh, one important service that is uh, able to schedule the rights, actually, uh, to send it to a customer and uh, bring it from A to B and so on. This is the Java part. This is easy and probably many of you know how to do this, right? <clears throat> So now, Marek, um, okay. how, how do I get this to the cloud? What, what should I do? Well, being cool, if you want to be cool, the first thing you have to do is to use containers, right? Everybody's using containers today. So who's using containers? Who has heard about containers? Like, less people heard about them than use it? That's interesting. Um, so the first thing would be to put it in the container, and then when we have, uh, have it in a container, we can put it somewhere on a, on a platform that will be able to run that container for you. So first containerize, then deploy. OK. Where? How, how, how do I deploy it? OK. First, you can use some kind of platform that will be online, uh, but uh, you probably want to do something on your machine, right? Like something local, so we can work without the Wi-Fi that doesn't work really here. Uh, so first, we will spin up uh, the cluster for you. Uh, so switch to the next slide. So we will use something called Minishift uh, slash Minikube. And this is a VM that provides you with a complete uh, platform for running containers running inside the VM on your machine. So there is no external dependency after that. And you can run it directly there. Wait. Uh, this presentation was supposed to be about Kubernetes. Uh, why are you mixing OpenShift here? OK, so OpenShift is a distribution of Kubernetes that adds some uh, features that we will use later in the, in the presentation to s like streamline the deployments, especially for the ABs, slash canaries. And wh why Kubernetes? Uh, aren't there better alternatives? 
Well, uh, there are alternatives, but uh, Kubernetes is, the, is, a, is a standard nowadays. Is, is it supposed to be a Jakarta EE standard? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> it's supposed to be like a, like a standard. Like, it's becoming a standard for running containers uh, in a cluster. OK. OK. You can, so, can you live with that, or do you need more info? Uh, let's suppose that I was able to download this. Uh, I have unpacked uh, the, the zip and I have added my mini shift to binary. Uh, what's, what, what should I do now? Uh, type mini shift space start. Mini shift space start and. Don't, don't press enter yet because this is going to start you a VM that's too small for Java. Java needs a lot of resources. Ah, come right? on, come on. Java, <laughs> Java is perfect. I, I'm not saying it's not perfect. I'm saying it needs a lot of resources. So how much resources? Uh, if you would write dash dash memory, uh, something like 8 gigabytes, uh, CPU 6, a bit. So OK, this size. is a nice new laptop with 32 gigs. So I may give 16. Good. Okay. You are fine. OK, now if you run it, your VM is already running. That's good, because we would be waiting for two hours on this Wi-Fi to download the VM. OK. <laughs> So we have started it already, and now that I have uh, the, the cluster here on my laptop, mm -hmm. how can I bring my application into it? So first you should log in. So do something like OC, OC. space, login. Yeah. This one. This one. So because I'm using Minishift, I probably don't need a real password. It will accept everything. Yeah. <coughs> there you go. So there are some projects there, mm -hmm. and I am inside the my project. Yes, correct. So now you can deploy. So you can do OC, new dash app, and then your GitHub URL. OK, this is my GitHub repo. And this is supposed to do what? Um, everything. It's a server bullet. It does everything for you. Not really. It, it will download the source code and it will check it. So you will see that there is, I will just go here, even though I will become green based on the information. Uh, a pipeline build has been created. Uh, do you, have you, did you have a Jenkins file in your repo? Yes, I did. Because okay. at our company, we have Jenkins instance. Sometimes we need a special engineer to care for it. But it, there's a Jenkins file, yes. Good. So there was a Jenkins file, so we created a Jenkins build. That means we, it's spinning up a Jenkins instance for you. Really? Yeah. And as well, it will link your build directly into that uh, Jenkins instance. So what you should do now is write mini shift slash console. Like this? Oh, nice. So my project and what, ah, there's a Jenkins instance. Can you see it? There is a Jenkins instance. Now if you go to build pipelines, you will see that there is a pipeline. That failed. And it failed. Why did it fail? Let's see. What does it say? Well, you are the Jenkins master. I'm just the cloud guy. You need to, you need to interpret this. I'm able to access the Git repository for whatever reason. Couldn't resolve GitHub host. Oh, so we were, we were said, we were said that the, that the network so here again. works. Try it again. So let's try it again. Start pipeline on the right side. Let's see. Well, there's a problem with the Wi-Fi's. If you do demo that relies on a connection network, and this looks better. Or maybe we, have, we haven't uh, consecrated enough beer yesterday to, to demo goods, and today we are not good. See, this time we fetched the source code, so we should be fine. Mm. The build is happening. Hopefully. Anyway. Uh, what it's going to do is uh, not that fancy because the Jenkins file is, is very basic. And um, 
There are some important things missing inside it. Oh, actually, this is not the right revision of the project, sorry. I should have reset. This is the end of the today's demo. We should go here. So at the start of the demo, the Jenkins file is very basic, and as you can notice, we are building without tests. And the reason is... Uh, you are lazy. You don't want to write tests. No, we have uh, real tests there, but the tests uh, required a database. And I didn't know how to provision a database inside Jenkins file, so how do I do it? Well, you will fetch a container with a database and run it. But great, but how? Um, okay, switch to the next revision. I have, written, I have written it for you, so you will see. Okay. So probably this one. Don't you have the magic next script? Yeah. So we'll push it. <clears throat> but so that this runs inside the cluster, do I just need to edit the, the Jenkins file, or do I need something else? Well, in our case, like in here, um, we will just deploy the database as part of the build process. So if the database doesn't exist, we will just spin it up in the, inside the Jenkins file. So let's have a look what we did uh, in the Jenkins file. Uh, let me guess. Because Jenkins file uh, is actually a uh, Groovy-based DSL, and we are Java developers, so Groovy is very close to what, we, what everybody of us knows. Uh, so the syntax is uh, quite uh, self-explaining. Uh, at the beginning, we uh, set some variables which look like um, database, uh, user password, and so on. Uh, this, what's, what's this? Why do I need so many projects? Because we will split different environments eventually, so we already have it there. Well, we will get to that. Okay. Then I'm using here OpenShift object. What's that? OpenShift object is provided by an OpenShift plugin that we have injected when we were starting your Jenkins instance. So essentially to simplify the integration between the platform and the Jenkins instance, when we spin up the Jenkins, we put the plugin in so you can reference OpenShift to simplify the, the, the Jenkins file. So it's okay. there for you. Okay, so once again, uh, we have Jenkins instance inside uh, OpenShift Kubernetes cluster, and that one has a plugin provisioned somehow automatically, and we can reference the plugin using uh, this object. And the object allows us to manipulate the cluster however we need for testing or uh, deploying into production. Uh, so once we have the magic OpenShift object, we can use it to provision the database. And this looks like a groovy, uh, groovy method. And inside that groovy method, we provision the database, right? Uh, this looks like a new app, probably a version of the new app command we have run on the, uh, in the console before. But now, uh, we are not using a GitHub repository as an argument. Uh, we are using, what, what's that? Well, that's a re reference to the Docker or container image running, uh, lying on the uh, Docker Hub. So on essentially Docker in Hub. here, because it will not see it in the internal registry. It will go de default to, uh, to Docker Hub in our case. So here I'm saying, please, uh, cluster, spin up a container using this image, and this will be the user and password. And so that uh, I can, my tests know where the database is, I will pass the data once again to my Maven build. Yeah? Yeah, yeah just so. so you can run the tests, right? So I have pushed to the Git repository and actually, you wanted to explain what kind of Git repository it is. Yeah, uh, so just to make it simpler for us again, so 
we don't want to rely on the Wi-Fi as much as we don't have to. So we are running uh, Gox, which is a, a small uh, system for doing GitHub, ho uh, Git repository hosting directly on the platform. We are running a Maven proxy that caches our Maven dependencies, and and the PostgreSQL is required for the Gox. So we try to like localize as much as the infrastructure as possible, running directly on his machine on the cluster, so we don't have to go outside. Okay, so Gox is a small GitHub inside the cluster. Yes. And when I push from my workspace, I push directly to the cluster, and there is a hook uh, on the Gox that starts uh, Jenkins build. So now we should see a new build here uh, on the pipelines. pipelines. And it passed. Passed. Let's look at the log. So there were two stages. There was the build and then there was the test. So it connected to his database, probably, hopefully, and finished the test. So let's see if we see the tests really passing. We should. We should spot at least one SQL command. Yeah, 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 there's some SQL here. And there's no error. That's a good sign, really. The tests were run against the real database. What's next? So now that you have uh, unit tested, probably the next step would be to try something like integration test. Okay, I have written a small script that uh, just iterates over the commits in this test in the, in the demo Git repository. The Git repository is also a label available on GitHub, so if you find this interesting, you can run the same thing at home. You can download Minishift, uh, clone the repo, uh, and uh, push all these uh, changes to your local cluster, and everything uh, should work as it works here, hopefully. Well, it will be smoother because they will have better Wi-Fi. Yeah, you see. So what's, what are the changes now? Well, we updated the Jenkins file, right? We changed something in the Jenkins file, and what's that? <coughs> well, so over here, we are building and testing an image. So, as I said before, we should uh, build a con some container, a container image, and then run the container. So, in here, we are actually building that, uh, uh, that container image and then deploying that container image explicitly. Okay, so in the previous step, we would, we've been doing a plain Maven build and run tests, and that's not enough what we will uh, to work uh, on in the cluster. To run our code in the cluster, to expose it to the end users, we need an image. And to build an image, uh, how we do it? Using your Maven. Using Maven. So can you explain how it works? Well, there is something called Fabricate Maven plugin that, is, uh, that wraps like the Docker commands and Docker logic, so you don't have to care about that. So if you go to pomxml file, there will be configuration of that Fabricate Maven plugin and it takes some base image, which is base JDK for Java 8, and then uh, it will uh, assemble a new uh, container with some environment variables, uh, some port, and because you have Spring Boot, uh, it will be an Eber, Eber jar at the end, so we just run that file. This is going to build the, uh, the uh, in container image, push it into the registry, and make it available to you to deploy. Okay, so the, the XML configuration of the Fabricate Maven plugin looks much like a Docker file, if anybody has, of you has already written one. Uh, we have the base image and, and, the, and the command, that are two substa substan substantial things there. <clears throat> Good. Um, our next script uh, has pushed to the, to the internal Git repository inside the cluster. We should see a build here. It has succeeded, actually. We can throw a look at the log, log see what it looks like with, the, with, the, with, with building the, the image. Here, this is the output of the Fabricate plugin. Uh, the exception 
is there, happens, and is not important. It he succeeded anyway. Just over right now, the first is, well, now you moved. But there is a pushing image to a registry. That registry is running also inside the platform. So we are just building in, inside the platform and pushing it directly into the platform. So nothing goes outside of the environment. OK, so the, there's a registry for images inside yep. the cluster that runs on the laptop. Yeah. By default, when you deploy OpenShift, you will get one. So we are not accessing uh, Docker Hub anymore. We access Docker Hub to pull the base image that we used to ah, build our you image. See. OK. So what's next? Integrate and build the stages. So now you have managed to actually uh, build the image, test the image, so you know that works. So the next thing would be to create something like staging environment and production environment that in the uh, staging environment uh, you would deploy the application and ch check and validate if it works. And then once you have that, you would uh, promote it into the uh, production environment. And each of those is uh, implemented as a project inside OpenShift. And project is essentially a Kubernetes namespace that provides more isolation than it's available in Kubernetes. So it's like namespace on steroids, if somebody is familiar with Kubernetes. OK, so that my resources for production do not mix with my testing. That's why I have several projects in the OpenShift cluster. Uh, to well, have the isolation. So Good. On, on, your, on your machine right now, there is uh, the basic networking plugin that allows communication among everybody if you know the IP address. However, if you would be deploying the production cluster, there would be a VLAN or VXLAN <coughs> per project. So every project has an isolated networking infrastructure that runs. So you cannot access staging from production unless you make it explicit somewhere. Okay, so the projects we were speaking so far, they live inside the cluster. There's one more thing here for, for structuring, and actually it's only a way to logically group uh, building steps that is called stage. That's a concept coming from a Jenkins file, which has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, the cluster, right? So we can create as many stages as we want. This is just a logical grouping of steps. And each of these stages appears in the, here in, in, in the pipelines view. And it can also be tracked uh, in, the, in Jenkins log. Uh, so now we see we have stage called stage and stage called production that just logical grouping for something that we do inside it. We use uh, OpenShift uh, object again to manipulate the cluster in some varied ways. Uh, so now, now that we were able to build the image, which actually, actually milled, means uh, not only to build it, but also to put, push it into the internal registry inside the cluster, now we can uh, do this, what's that? So we take the uh, image that's already in the registry available in one project and we make it available in the other project as well. So we effectively just by naming it, we make it available inside the different projects. So OpenShift Tech does actually some, in, some, yeah. some rena renaming or putting labels on the, on the images so that they can be used on the proper places. Now we are my marking the test image as a stage image and uh, from now on we are creating an application using that image and that's it. Yes, the other two more things that you have there is the probes. So when you spin up your application we set up the probes. There is a readiness probe that check that the application has started correctly, and liveness probe checks if uh, the application is still running fine. So effectively, we automate the checks if everything's hmm. running smoothly for you. Okay. And then there is this rollout. What's that? Just do it. Just wait. Do and wait. Yeah. Wait for what? 
for the application to be deployed. Okay. So that the following steps met, make sense, actually. This is the end of the stage called stage. And that's where we are asking the developer to check again manually or however uh, if he's satisfied with the, with the state of the application. And we are uh, sending him an, an alert, alert where he can say yes or no to promote to production. So because we have pushed this to the internal Git repo already, we should see exactly this question in the Git, uh, in, in Jenkins console. No, it failed. Mm, you failed. Let's see why. If this is because of the demo gods. Yes, we saw this uh, problem uh, in the hallway. Try to rerun it again. When we were on the, on the conference Wi-Fi. Yeah. And we were not able to recover, actually. For some reason, we cannot dial or actually resolve the DNS of the Docker Hub uh, name, name to IP address, and it just fails on it. But then it worked for next two <coughs> hours, then it failed again. So I suppose th this will fail again, and we will uh, not see anything new. Uh, no, it will, it will while it's running, uh, does anybody have a question? Not a question, just a suggestion. Try using Google's DNS, maybe. Uh, Google DNS? Yeah, I mean, just connection. I'm not sure. Like, I, I know what, what's happening there is that it is trying to connect to his, from the VM that is running OpenShift. It tries to dial, uh, to translate using the main machine uh, because there is an, an AT uh, in the process. There was a question at the end. Like, uh, what is doing uh, the wait exactly? Uh, is it really waiting for some kind of uh, server is ready message in the log? Or uh, actually testing some actual actuator endpoint to check if the server is ready? Uh, there could be different ways how to implement it. Um, Essentially, they are free right now. Uh, you can wait for a TCP or UDP port to be available. You can check if uh, some HTTP endpoint is returning something that's reasonable. That means for two up to 300 something, right? Or uh, the last one is to run a script in the container. So you can have a script inside the container that if it, if it returns zero, you are fine. If it returns one or something else, it will be not okay. This, the, all of these three strategies are available for both uh, liveness and readiness probes. So it, you have complete flexibility into how to implement them. In our case, we will be having a special endpoint that is saying healthy or unhealthy. So application is responsible for checking if it's healthy or not. So we suppose... Did it fail it, again? And we will probably not see a successful build anymore. Oh my God. Uh, so let's just continue and explain uh, the next stages. We think this is of, because of the network. So what we are doing next. Uh, in the last uh, iteration, we uh, already had a push to the special environment called production, which was supposed to be exposed to the, to the end users. And that's actually not what we want. Uh, we need to have some controlled way to, uh, to deploy new versions of the application. So there are different ways how to do that. Uh, the basic one is blue-green deployment. So essentially what we do is to uh, spin up a new version of the application alongside the old one. And we wait if everything's fine, and then we just switch to the, uh, to the new one. Yeah, the switch is important. Uh, which part or which, which concept, which, which, which object of the uh, cluster takes care for this? So we have used something called route, uh, and the route is responsible for changing the destination where the request will going to. Is this an OpenShift specific concept? Well, 
route is OpenShift specific. In Kubernetes, you have ingress. But both, like this functionality is in both, ingress and, uh, and the route. So you can use it on Kubernetes and OpenShift as well. It will be slightly different with the canaries. And it should be said that ingress is not, not that old. And I think at times where we were creating this uh, demo several months ago, the ingress wasn't there, probably. Well, it's still quite early. And well, they're different. It's more complex than, than routes to deploy it. OK, so uh, we are actually preparing the new version of the deployment uh, in parallel. And once we switch, the old one is still there, and it's easy to switch back. That's the idea behind, behind Blue Green. Uh, let's have a look what happened here. We have pushed to the local repo, uh, to the internal Git repository, and uh, we should have. And you failed again on the same problem. Yeah. But uh, there should already be in the next build for for uh, for this next revision. This is the old one, I think. No, it's blue green. It's already blue green yeah, and failed uh, well, at the fair. same location. Yes. So uh, we had one version for for blue. In the next one, we were supposed to show the the other color. <laughs> I can uh, show you what is to do. Well, we managed to fix your DNS problem. What did you do before? I rebooted the machine, and uh, we actually used your 3G connection. Oh, that's true. We used my 3G, but I think I still have only E here. Yeah, there is no 3G here. So let's uh, have a look uh, at the changes here. So we are adding, uh, the, oh, actually, we haven't explained this yet. <clears throat> That's how we are doing the switching uh, of the new, between the new and old version. Uh, because Jenkins file is actually uh, a procedural language, it's very easy to code any logic there. And uh, we, have, we need two colors two parallel deployments, and we have the OpenShift object, and we just can do these things there, right? So uh, here at the beginning, we set the right uh, color to the right variable, which one is new and old, depending on uh, what's there uh, in, the, in the root. Root is the object that cares for the switching. And uh, except for, um, for those variables, we also need to change how we handle, how we mark the images. Now, uh, the, the tag for the image also contains the color so that we can uh, access them in parallel. And here, when creating the, the deployment using the new app command, we use the colored image. And that's actually it here. Yeah, you just create a new route if it doesn't exist and set it to the specific one or to the, to the blue, I think, by Yeah, default. this is the switching on the route. If the route exists uh, uh, already, we change the color here. OK? So this was the first uh, blue-green. And the second one was uh, where we have added to the Jenkins console how to turn back to the previous color. And uh, it's using the patch command that just changes the definition of the root. Yeah, the, the choosing the patches uh, in, this, in this particular case, it doesn't trigger any redeployments or anything. It just reroutes uh, the traffic from one to the other. So it's like almost instant. Uh, all the new requests that will be coming will be hitting the new uh, or the other service uh, once you run it. And there will be, almost, there will be zero downtime. <clears throat> so now what's, what's wrong with Blue Green? 
well, they are fine, they do it at work, but the same with uh, almost all the uh, more complex strategies. You will need to make sure that you follow you know, some guidelines. Like it's recommended to have uh, stateless applications. So if you are using uh, applications in this kind of platform, it's better to have it stateful, stateless so that if something fails, it's easier to recover from that. The other thing is uh, if you have database uh, and you do uh, blue-greens, you have two uh, different versions that needs to be compatible with the schema of the database all the time, right? So if you have backward incompatible changes, uh, it will not probably work for you. So in that case, you will need to, so if like most of the cases, you would be doing this with backward compatible things, then when you do something backward incompatible, you will need to choose some other strategy to actually do it because this will, not, this will be failing for you. Uh, but funny enough, uh, it is actually possible to do a database uh, evolution of the database schema using uh, back and forward compatible uh, changes. And there's a very good book written on the subject by our colleague Edson Yanaga. And if you ever hit this issue, you should, you should read the book because there are very nice examples and strategies about exactly this. How should you evolve your database schema in the steps so that it's an, at every point possible to roll back to the previous stage and the old application can still communicate although the schema is already in the future version. Right? Let me try something. Can you get me into the mini shift VM, mini shift SSH? That was a good point. So here, here's the cluster. Go in mini shift SSH. Uh, I edit the uh, etc resolve file in there. Mm, do we have nano? You have them most probably. No, no, we don't. What do we have? VI. We have VI, but I, I don't know how to uh, how to exit VI. Do you know? <laughs> Uh, anybody has a question in between? No questions. So in the next step, we are going to speak about Canary deplo uh, deployments. Uh, anybody of you knows uh, why they are called Canaries? Uh, the story is very short and uh, the, the miners in the USA mining for coal uh, we're working deep uh, under the surface and there are uh, poisonous gases there. And for them to figure out early that the gas is there, they took canary with them uh, in a cage and as long as the canary was singing, everything was fine. But uh, the moment the canary died, they knew the gas poisoned it and they need to escape. So canary is something small to use uh, to test the environment, if it's healthy, right? And uh, exactly this is the reason why canary deployments are called canary. You found something interesting? No, I just tried to switch inside the VM. That could work. Well, it wouldn't make sense on your machine because we still cannot dial to that machine, but we may be able to get out of the machine from there. if something doesn't re replace the resolve file in between our tests. <coughs> it may happen as well. The manual changes are not very persistent in modern distributions. So blue-green deployments have uh, one more issue, and the issue is that it's using quite a lot of resources. We are keeping uh, all nodes, uh, all the instances of the new version and old version in parallel. Uh, Canary uh, is saving uh, resources in that respect. We need re less resources because uh, we are using, we are doing a gradual rollout of the new version, one by one or something like that. So we start with a small number 
ideally one instance of the new version of the application. We send a part of the traffic to it and see what happens. We um, observe uh, the health of the canary. How we do it is uh, hard to explain uh, in, this, uh, in this presentation. We are doing something very simple uh, using means offered uh, by Spring Boot, uh, which is by no way uh, sufficient solution uh, for production. You probably want to have a proper uh, monitoring with metrics and some threshold set uh, so that you really get some, some, uh, some grouped, some aggregated view of the application health. And once you have it, in every moment you can decide if the canary is healthy or not, right? And uh, how we do this uh, iterative checking inside this demo is using a simple loop uh, inside the Jenkins file. Because Jenkins file is just a groovy based DSL, it's very easy to, to implement a for loop. So we have a for loop there with, I don't know, like uh, 10 iterations. Where is it? Here. And uh, the cr criterion we have chosen is uh, like if we see three failures uh, in the, or three unhealthy states of the new version of the application, we decide that the canary is dead. And throw it away and send 100% of the traffic to the old version. If the canary survives, meaning uh, 10 iterations of the loop work well, then 100% of the traffic is sent to the new version, and from that moment, it's the stable version. It's not canary anymore, okay? Because this laptop is uh, limited, we are working with just uh, two nodes or two instances of the application again. So that means we have just uh, three steps in the gradual uh, roll-up of the new version. First, 100% goes to old version, then 50% goes to old, 50 to new, and in the third, third stage, 100% uh, goes to the, the new one. Because it will probably fail, but <laughs> we can have a look, yes, it failed. Uh, we cannot show the output, what it looks like, uh, with the inside the Jenkins log, <clears throat> uh, so that you can see it live. But we have one more step here demonstrating uh, a canary that doesn't succeed. So in this uh, iteration, the canary was healthy. Uh, the health endpoint were, was. Uh, uh, replying with uh, 200 all the times, and in the next one, the health endpoint that we have created, especially for demonstrating this, returns uh, 503 all the time, so that it's easy to show uh, that in the Jenkins log we see three failures, and then the canary is just thrown away and all traffic is sent to the, to the old version. Uh, we are not lucky enough to show this to you, but hopefully we were at least um, able to explain the basic principles behind this. That's actually it, what we had prepared. We are very, very sorry that it failed. Uh, and we think this is because of the network and uh, we have just this uh, short wrap-up. If you want to start uh, experimenting on your laptop... You lost the wrap-up. <laughs> anyway, if you want to start experimenting, uh, you please download uh, Mini Cube or Mini Shift. It's very easy to start with. You can use your local laptop. You can screw up, you can delete the cluster, start anew, it costs nothing. 
And uh, that's the ideal way to start experimenting. Once you have uh, the cluster and you decide for a uh, mini shift, you can, uh, you can see that Jenkins is the first class citizen there. Once you have a Jenkins file inside your Git project, uh, it understands it and creates a Jenkins instance for you that runs your Jenkins file, which is very practical and saves time. You don't need to set up anything anywhere. It's just there out of the box. And uh, if you uh, look at my Twitter handle, Pipalaga, which is on, uh, in the, on the conference page too, uh, we will hang these slides uh, on my Twitter account and uh, you can try at home. And uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me or Marek, either with Jenkins files or the cluster how to set up a database and things like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>